Thanks so much, everyone, for being here. I want to just get this thing kicked off with uh, a quick introduction uh, to the sort of the driving force behind Champions of Change and um, a mentor to many of us here at the White House, the Director of Public Engagement here at the White House, John Carson. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the White House. Welcome to everyone who's here in person. Uh, welcome to everyone who's following us uh, online today. And a big, big welcome uh, to our champions of change here who are doing incredible work greening our, our cities and towns across the country. I wanted to kick things off just by first telling you a little bit about the idea behind the Champions of Change program. And then I have an ask. I have an ask for everyone who's online, everyone who's here in the audience, and most importantly, for our champions of change. We, um, we started the Champions of Change program because this president firmly believes that we have no monopoly on good ideas here in Washington, D.C. And that, well, all these debates are going on here in town between us and Congress about major policies issues of the day. Well, those fights and debates are going on all across the country. There are thousands of people like our Champions of Change here today who are making change happen in their communities. And we want to lift these stories up, shine a spotlight on them, um, to not just share the good ideas and best practices that they're developing in places like Tallahassee and Pittsburgh, um, but to encourage others to take the mantle to be part of change in their community. And that leads me to the quick ask that I, I have for everyone. Um, whether you're online, here in the audience, or our champions, particularly our champions, help tell the story of what you saw here today. Tell the story of the change that is happening, the greening that is going on, leading by example uh, in our cities and town. Now, many of you here in the audience, I know you're here today because you work on these issues. Those of you following online, these are issues uh, that I'm personally passionate and I know many of are you about. And I, I ask you this for two separate reasons. First of all, um, you're gonna hear some great ideas here today uh, from our administration folks who are here today, from our champions of change. And we need to share those concrete ideas and best practices. But I also ask you to share the story of what you're doing, of what you learned today, because no matter what you think on the policy issues we're debating today, I think everyone would agree what we need is more Americans being part of the process, more Americans standing up like our champions of change and saying, I believe I can make a difference in my community. And that's the story of, of what our champions are doing here today. So tweet about it. You can tweet me, at John Carson 44. If you don't know what Twitter is, you should look it up and get yourself an account. Our hashtag is uh, hashtag WHChamps. Um, tweet about it, blog about it, write about it. Stop three people in the parking lot at the grocery store tomorrow and tell them what you learned about today. Because we need your help, not just in sharing these good ideas, but encouraging others to be part of the change. And, and here to kick things off today, I think we couldn't have a more perfect uh, administration leader, the president's top advisor on energy and environmental issues, someone who has been in your shoes, who's worked at the city level, who's worked at the state level, knows what works, knows how to affect the kind of change that we're seeing. And I know someone who's so excited uh, to be here with you all today, our chair at the Council on Environmental Quality, and my former boss, where I worked for the first two years in the administration, Chair Nancy Sutley. Thank you, John, and uh, good afternoon, and welcome to all of you uh, to the White House. And uh, we're so glad to have you here, and uh, really glad to have these champions of change here. And as you heard John say, and I know it's true, that the president um, has always said that true change doesn't come from Washington. It comes from Americans who are making a, a difference at work, at home, and in their communities. And, and that's why uh, we created the champion of change program and this week we're recognizing nine champions who are working within their communities to create an America that's built to last. Now every day every person on this panel or these people you will meet uh, meet some of the most significant challenges uh, that we face as a country and that they face in their communities. They're finding ways to save energy and to save money, uh, to revitalize outdoor spaces and to advance really amazing uh, and innovative approaches to sustainability that's improving the quality of life in our cities and towns. And as John told you, I spent 10 years in state and local government 
And I know that it takes a combination of, of great ideas, uh, hard work, and a little bit of magic uh, to, to really uh, make these things work. And uh, you know, the Obama administration, I know we have a number of folks here from the administration, believes strongly that sustainable communities uh, support a strong economy. And we're committed to supporting the work that all of you are doing to make your cities and towns healthier places to live and to work and to play and to grow the economy. Uh, with the President's leadership, we've made the largest investment in clean energy in American history. Uh, and a lot of that has gone to the state and local level, and it's helped us to do things like uh, doubling our capacity to generate renewable energy in this country. And we've awarded more than $1.7 billion to support sustainability goals in more than 550 communities. We're on track uh, as a nation to double the fuel efficiency of our cars by 2025. And it'll save people money, it'll reduce our dependence on imported oil, and it'll save 6 billion metric tons of carbon pollution. We put in place strong new clean air standards for power plants that will prevent tens of thousands of heart attacks and hundreds of thousands of asthma attacks each year. And we've marked the most extensive expansion of land and water conservation in a generation. We all have a role to play in building a more sustainable future for our communities and for our country. And we're recognizing some uh, true leaders here today, and I want to thank all of you uh, for the amazing work that you're doing to improve our, our cities uh, and our towns. And I know that as you fight for uh, healthier and, and more successful uh, communities, uh, the President and this administration uh, are on your side. Um, and I think, are you ready? Okay, great. Uh, so I, I, I really I get the great pleasure today uh, to introduce someone um, who knows a little bit about uh, state and local government, but also uh, works very closely with the president and who cares uh, very much about the work that you're all doing as champions of change. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, senior advisor to the president, Valerie Jarrett. Thank you, Nancy. Good afternoon, everyone. It's just a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, as Nancy said, I do know a little bit about local government. I entered um, the public sector uh, working for Mayor Washington in Chicago, and after I gave up practicing law for him, I ran the Department of Planning and Development for Mayor Daley. And so I know firsthand just uh, how important each of your roles is at the local level because I work so closely with folks who had your positions in Chicago. And so I just want to welcome you here on behalf of the president. Uh, we know change does not happen in Washington. Change happens on the ground. And the magic that you work each and every day is uh, what make, moves our country forward. And so we love this Champions of Change um, initiative because it gives us a chance to really highlight those uh, folks around the country who are making an extraordinary difference. And so the nine people that we're honoring today, and I want to ask you guys to stand because I'm going to leave before you come up here. So I want to have a chance just to see all nine of you. If you guys could stand and be recognized for a second. <clears throat> Thank you. We selected you because you're using innovative approaches to promote energy efficiency and renewable energy and revitalizing outdoor spaces and waterways and greening our schools, all designed to improve the quality of life in our cities and towns across our country. And that's something that we take great pride in recognizing and celebrating here at the White House. You heard from the Nancy um, the unprecedented actions that President Obama has taken to lay a foundation for a clean energy economy and tackling the issues that are so important to protecting our environment. But what I really wanted to say is to just emphasize that everyone has a role to play. There's so much more left to do that we could be doing together with you collectively. We want to make sure that the time that we have together, we're not just honoring our champions, but we're also sharing best practices and learning from one another and doing everything that we can to make sure that our cities and our counties and our urban areas and our rural areas all across the country 
are safer, more secure, uh, have the best practices that will lead to a healthier planet. And so um, I'm honored to have a chance to just stop by and, and congratulate the champions, but thank everybody who's here partnering with us and doing everything we can to move our country forward. So thank you very much, and congratulations to you. And now, I forgot, <laughs> my job is to introduce to you David Agnew, who is the Deputy uh, Assistant to the President in charge of Intergovernmental Affairs and a uh, person with whom I work so closely and who also came from local government working for um, one of our favorite mayors uh, in North Carolina. So, South Carolina. I'm looking at him and I'm going, no, no, it's not North Carolina, it's South Carolina. So, come on up, David. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, and thank you, Valerie, for that introduction. She has North Carolina on the brain because of that trip yesterday. Uh, I worked for one of the, America's greatest mayors, the mayor of Charleston, South Carolina, Joe Riley, who's been uh, in office now for a mere 36 years. Uh, he's now in his 10th four-year term as mayor of Charleston, and it's a, even more impressive when you watch how he governs. He doesn't govern in a shy way or a, a quiet way. He's uh, full steam ahead. Uh, to the wall every single minute and, and manage to maintain that level of energy over 36 years. It's an amazing thing to watch. So my job here at the White House uh, is to work with local government and state government and tribal government officials across the, across the country. And in that capacity, I see every single day the, the incredible, innovative things that local leaders do to make this country a better place. Um, elected officials, when they come to the White House to talk to us, the best ones don't talk about what it is they're doing in their office. The best ones tell us what's going on in their communities. They tell us what leaders in their communities are doing every day, and they recognize that as an elected official, their job is not to instigate every single good idea. It's to help the great ideas that are germinating from the streets in their communities and make those good ideas a reality as an elected official. So that's what they talk to us about. So we hear these stories day after day after day, and it's very exciting. And one thing is crystal clear to me, that it, that is that some of the most creative governance, some of the most powerful innovation is occurring at the state and local level. There's just no doubt that's where it's happening. Uh, mayors are, across the country are working with their citizens to move this country forward, and it's an, exciting, uh, it's an exciting group of people that we have across the country working at the local level. This is especially true in our efforts to create a sustainable, clean energy future for America. Uh, you think about the uh, decade that occurred before we got here, uh, mayors uh, on climate change, for example, there was a, a, a far too little action occurring at the federal level. Mayors are the ones that stood up and said, that's not okay. If They said, if the federal government won't act, then we'll start taking action ourselves. And over a thousand mayors signed the Mayor's Climate Protection Agreement, and they started taking action uh, to make the situation better. There's no better example of thinking globally and acting locally that I, can, that I know of than, than just what occurred during uh, that time period. So the, the champions of change that we're honoring here today are a testament to the reality that so much, is, uh, so much good stuff is happening at the local level. We have three mayors in the house with us today. I ask you all to stand up. Mayor John Marks from Tallahassee, Florida. Mayor George Kaufman of Jonestown, Pennsylvania. And Mayor Alan McCormick of Williamson, West Virginia. So welcome uh, to the mayors. Thank you for being here. We appreciate your presence and appreciate what you do on a, on a daily basis. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you all uh, the nine champions of change that we're here to honor. And I would ask the champion of change that I mentioned to come up and, and take your place on stage uh, when I call your name. Our first champion is Cynthia Barber. <laughs> uh, Cynthia is from Mayor Mark's hometown of uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, she is the director of the City of Tallahassee's Environmental Policy and Energy Resource Department. Hello, welcome. Uh, this department ensures environmental regulatory compliance for operations and facilities and develops and implements environmental policies, programs, and initiatives that help build a more sustainable, livable Tallahassee. Our next champion is Lindsay Baxter, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, 
Welcome. Uh, Lindsay is being recognized for her work as the very first sustainability coordinator for the city of Pittsburgh. She works in the office of Mayor Luke Ravenstall, where she spearheads projects to reduce environmental impacts and coordinate education and outreach to Pittsburgh's residents and businesses. Our next champion is Dr. Jackie Holt Cole. Jackie is from Galveston, Texas. And in September of 2008, shortly after Hurricane Ike made landfall on Galveston Island, Jackie marshaled her community to respond to what one U.S. Forest Service official described as the worst loss of urban forest in the country's history, which is saying a lot. Um, being from Charleston, we uh, survived Hurricane Hugo, and when I saw the numbers of trees that were downed in Hurricane Hugo, if it was worse than that, it's an, um, uh, a really powerful thing. So responding to that emerging crisis of unsafe dead trees and a groundswell of citizens eager to re replant, uh, Dr. Cole organized the city's first citizens groups to develop a replanting strategy. This effort quickly led to the establishment of two organizations, Galveston's Municipal Tree Committee, the first such entity to report directly to the city council, and the Galveston Island Tree Conservancy, a nonprofit with close ties to the community. Thanks to her efforts over the past three years, more than 8,000 trees have been replanted, and there are plans to plant another 3,000 trees this year, all paid for by private donations. Welcome. Our next champion of change is Brian Kasher. Welcome, Brian. From Charlotte, North Carolina, Brian is the manager of environmental health and safety for Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools where he helps lead teams working on environmental improvement in various areas. Brian is a principal author of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education Environmental Policy, the Strategic Plan 2014 Environmental Focus Area, and the Associated Tactic Management Plans. He also currently serves as an appointee of the North Carolina Secretary of the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources to the North Carolina Environmental Stewardship Advisory Committee. And uh, ask, I'm, I'm resisting this urge on every single one, but please say hello to Mayor Fox. Uh, works for the great mayor uh, down there in Charlotte. Will do. Um, our next champion of change is Eric Mathis. <laughs> Welcome, Eric. Uh, from Williamson, West Virginia, Eric is the founder and director of the Jobs Project, which has been at the forefront of initiatives to bridge the gap between the fossil fuel and renewable energy in industries through the development and implementation of innovative finance and business models. Eric is also helping develop a comprehensive project titled Sustainable Williamson, which emphasizes health and wellness as a key component for economic revitalization. So welcome, Eric. Our next champion is Steve Montel. Welcome, Steve. Uh, from Flint, Michigan. He was uh, nominated by their outstanding mayor in Flint, Dane Wally, who we work with closely and, and like a whole lot. Uh, Steve is a project manager with the Center for Community Progress in Flint, where his work centers on complex urban redevelopment projects and leveraging government and community assets to take projects from the planning stages to, imp to implementation. He's established an unprecedented coalition of local government agencies, other institutions, and community groups to green the corridor along the Flint River including approximately 180 acres of brownfields, known as Chevy in the Hole, where there were, uh, general, in the hole. In the hole, uh, where there were general Motors uh, Chevrolet factory buildings. So uh, welcome to Steve. <laughs> Our next champion of change is Marion Robidas. Robidas, sorry. Uh, welcome to Marion. from uh, Jonestown, Pennsylvania. Uh, since 2005, Marion has been the principal of Jonestown Elementary School. Throughout her 22 years in education, she's been a strong proponent for active and authentic real world learning and for creating opportunities that allow students to do their own problem solving. She played a role in implementing the People, Land, and Community Education Initiative called PLACE that helps educators, students, and community leaders learn what it means to be green and promotes the concepts of community government and empowering young people by connecting learning and leadership skills. So welcome to, to Marion. 
Our next champion of change is Deborah Scott. And, uh, she's from Atlanta, Georgia, so I have to ask her to say hello to Kasim Reed, please. Can't help myself. I'll try to stop doing that, but I can't stop. Uh, Deborah is the executive director of Stand Up, a think and act tank. I love that, a think and act tank for working families. Stand Up supports community economic development through advocacy, project work agreements, and other policies that increase equity and access to opportunity. She's also the convener for Emerald Cities Atlanta, a regional affiliate of the National em Emerald Cities Collaborative that supports economic growth and job creation by retrofitting buildings to conserve energy, water, and other resources. And we uh, work with Emerald Cities here at the White House, so we know their work well. Uh, through her Stand Up and Emerald Cities efforts, Deborah has been instrumental in developing a model Atlanta Regional Workforce Pipeline that seeks to align the training efforts of labor, educational, and community-based groups with market factors such as demand growth and shifting demographics. Deborah is a leading advocate for employing sustainable principles in the effort to expand opportunity and transform disadvantaged communities. So welcome, Deborah. Our last champion of change is Jeff Shoemaker. From the great city of Denver with the great mayor, Michael Hancock. <laughs> and a great governor, John Hickenlooper. Um, since 1982, Jeff has been the executive director of the Greenway Foundation, the nonprofit organization that initiated the reclamation of the Denver's South Platte River and its tri tributaries. Since its founding in 1974, the Greenway Foundation has collaborated with countless public and private partners to create over 100 million of environmental and recreational enhancements to these urban waterways, which has in turn created over 10 billion in economic benefits to the surrounding area. And if you haven't been to Denver to see some of their good work, I encourage you to go. It's beautiful, beautiful place uh, that's been created there. So I want you all please join me in giving these champions of change a warm round of applause. As, as we know from our work every single day in the White House, some of the most incredible things across the country are happening in, in cities led by folks just like these uh, we have here with us today. So thank you for your leadership. Thank you for all that you've done. It's a great honor to be a part of a White House ceremony honoring you. And uh, we're pleased with what you're doing and, and more pleased that we can recognize it here today. I encourage you to keep, keep at it, keep going, and keep making good things happen in your communities. So thank you. All right. We look forward to a great day of learning and discussion, and I believe, uh, Rohan, we're now going to start our next panel. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. I'm not Rohan Patel. Uh, my name is Lindsay Randall. I'm here at the with the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and I have the honor of introducing the moderator for our first panel. Uh, Ms. Shelley Paticha is the director of at the Office of Sustainable Housing and Communities at the uh, Department of Housing and Ur Urban Development. Come on up. Thank you so much. Welcome to Washington, D.C., everyone. And, Thank you. And, uh, Happy Earth, I've been calling it Earth Week. Earth Week, <laughs> Earth Month. <laughs> because we, uh, we are, are celebrating in HUD all week. We've got all kinds of different activities, and uh, this is one of them. So thank you thank for, you for coming and, and supporting this work and doing such incredible work locally. We really, really appreciate it. And I was <clears throat> really, uh, I had the opportunity to look at the bios before I came in to all of the champions, very, very impressive work, really exciting, and it's so wonderful to see local activism really taking on uh, many of these issues and getting recognized. This is really what uh, many of us who are part of this administration are really interested in. Um, I'm gonna moderate a little panel here and ask, uh, kind of maybe even just go down the line and ask folks to just spend a couple of minutes on, you know, what brought you here and, and your priorities, and then maybe do a little bit of uh, 
Q&A, and at some point we're going to have time to open it up to the audience. So for those of you who are out in the audience, please think of some questions because I want to make sure that we have uh, plenty of time to have a conversation. And I notice we have a lot of people coming in. Uh, earlier the security line was really uh, quite challenging. So anyway, Lindsay, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about your work. Sure, thank you. I'd like to thank the um, CEQ and the administration for the opportunity to be here today. It's a privilege to be representing the city of Pittsburgh. I am in a unique position compared to, I think, my, my fellow nominees in that I actually have transitioned to a position with Pennsylvania Environmental Council, which is one of the city's partners on implementing sustainability projects, and we're a statewide organization. Um, but I'm here today representing the work that I did as the first sustainability coordinator for the city of Pittsburgh. And that was a new position created in 2008 whenever I started with the city. Um, the one thing that I want to make sure I don't forget to mention is that's not the beginning of the city of Pittsburgh's environmental efforts. Um, that's far into the city's efforts to become a green city. Um, we had had a long history of successful recycling programs. Um, tree planting, tree giveaways, um, environmental education, and really at the point that the Office of Sustainability was created in 2008, um, it was in recognition of the fact that there needed to be a point person who was making sure that these um, sustainability activities weren't just individual projects operating in silos, but were becoming a part of the culture of the organization and a very integrated part of city operations. Um, Sustainability coordinators tend to work um, in two main areas of focus, looking at the environmental impact of their organization's operations and how can we reduce that. And the other side of it is working with your constituents, working with the citizens and the businesses in your community to help them get the resources and the education they need to reduce their environmental impact, to save money, to live more healthy. Um, being that it was a brand new office, we tended to focus a little more when I was with the city on looking internally with the idea that we really need to be practicing what we were preaching. And we need to be saving money, using taxpayer dollars wisely, um, and, and saving those funds that then we could roll into more innovative projects that were reaching out further into the community. Um, I don't want to waste too much time naming a whole lot of projects that we worked on. Hopefully that will come up in the question and the answer period. Um, but the, the one thing I want to make sure I say is that all of our projects really try to hit those three legs of sustainability, the environmental, the economic, and the social, which I think is only appropriate for uh, local government. To be looking at how you're reducing environmental impact and, and creating a healthier community, using public money wisely and efficiently, and improving the services that you're providing to your residents and to your businesses. Um, just in closing of my remarks, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my position was a very small, small piece of the entire operation, and so I, I want to make sure I'm thanking um, the incredible leadership of Mayor Luke Ravenstahl, who had the vision to create a position like this and to, to see that sustainability is really good business. It's not just about the environment. Um, and to thank our partners in City Council who are supportive of so many of these initiatives and really just to thank the folks who work in the city departments um, across the board, from your legal department, from your budget office, and particularly those fine folks who work in planning departments, in public works, the people on the ground, our plumbers, our electricians. It's just been a joy to work with them, and I look forward to, to talking with everyone later. Thank you. Brian, tell us about what you've been doing. Sure. At Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, <clears throat> uh, we really got our start in environmental work and sustainability and stewardship through a partnership with the US EPA's Tools for Schools program uh, several years ago. And through a, a vibrant relationship, um, our school district um, very much adopted sustainability and environmental stewardship beyond environmental health, which was the root of our partnership with Tools for Schools. Um, we have partnered with associations like the American Association of School Administrators or the American School Business Officials International, uh, the National Healthy Schools Coalition, Sierra Club, Habitat and Wildlife Keepers, and our Board of Education adopted Environmental Policy, ECF, back in 2008, which 
um, declares that CMS will be a good environmental steward and neighbor. Um, behavior change being one of seven focus areas. We actually expanded our energy policy into being more of a sustainability environmental stewardship policy. Beyond that, we also um, included as one of our six strategic plan goals for 2014, adopted environmental stewardship as one of our six goals um, looking forward to 2014. Um, to, to bring it right down to earth, uh, where the kids are at, our students are so much, really any public going green effort needs to involve your public school system, all your schools. Let me let me open that up. It needs to involve all your schools. The children are the leaders of tomorrow. They're so in tune to what's going on. I get lectures from fourth graders on the carbon cycle, okay? <laughs> Stuff that most of us got in college. I'm not yeah. saying this lightly. Our kids are learning this in elementary school today. They're working on the Charlotte-Mecklenburg region tree canopy, water protections, air quality, waste diversion, recycling, uh, sustainable development, um, uh, greening our fleets. There's so much going on. And, with, with organizations like the Coalition for High Performance Schools and USGBC and others working with schools across the nation. Um, I just, I think my part up here is to, is to say that really embrace your schools, engage them, and uh, there's not a larger environmental footprint out there in the public sector, usually at the local level, than your public schools. It's the largest single investment your local public makes, and it has the greatest opportunity for seeding things like clean green power okay so hopefully we can chat some more as we get into oh. it what a great message thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you thank you deborah yes why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing well first of all thank you for having me um i stand on the shoulders of um, and a lot of people and i didn't bring our mayor which we love kasim reed but i did bring our state fed president charlie Fle fleming who is the um, president of the AFL-CIO in Georgia and Art Lujan from the National Building Trades. Um, um, I'm really excited to be here because we started a program called Trade Up and it's all about greening the workforce um, and making sure the workforce is ready for the jobs that are coming. So I have two of our students, two of our best students, Steve Jones here, here. and Please Linda Tillman. <laughs> They, they are both veterans, um, and they are both um, work, well, Linda, we need a job for you, right? Uh, but, but Steve just got a job as the foreman um, at Fort McPherson, one of the bases that are being, being closed, so she, he's a foreman there now. Uh, we've trained 104 students um, in our program, but our program is really designed to make sure that we have at-risk youth, community members that wouldn't normally have an opportunity for this kind of, of work to really get skilled up, and we do that with partners. We do that with the Urban League, and I see um, Gary here from um, HT, HDTS Enterprises, and Urban League, and the um, Youth Build and Policy Link. Um, but, but Emerald Cities is our umbrella organization that we're working with because we really have a collaborative table where all the partners are around the table trying to figure out if you have the supply side of, of your workers, how do you get them through the pipeline to get to the end and actually get the skills that they need to green up these buildings. Um, this is a new industry and we know that um, the trades, they're graying out. I hate to say it, but <laughs> six out of 10 tradesmen um, won't be there in the next 10 years because they'll be retiring. And so we're training skilled community members that want to change their life. In some cases, they're ex-offenders. In other cases, they're um, high school dropouts or um, struggling with GED. And we take them and we try to transform them through the construction trades. And we have a wonderful partnership with the building trades. Um, and so we're uh, pleased um, of the partnership. But it all started with Stand Up, and I see our stand Stand Up staff here as well. Stand Up is a think and act tank for working communities and because of some policy wins um, it was really necessary for us to start a trade up program because we, we know that as we look at community workforce agreements it's all about who's going to get the jobs. If there's public money there should be a public good and if, there, if a project is in your community you should actually benefit from that. So we believe in that and we, we appreciate President Obama and this administration for all the work that, that you've done. But um, we thank you for the continued partnership because we've only just begun. Beautiful. Now, I just want to point out that she, this, this woman walks the talk because she also has her <laughs> MARTA, the transit <laughs> agency <laughs> pen. Yes, and you can have that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's orange. Yeah. You missed that part. 
<laughs> Thank you. Eric. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Still getting over the laughter and everything. I know. I, too, am standing on the shoulders of giants as well as following in the footsteps of many great leaders across the nation. Um, and I guess that's why I'm here as well, is to kind of, um, a lot of our successes are associated with us stealing ideas and also mm -hmm. innovating around those ideas. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about two of those specific um, projects that we're working on, but before I begin, I also wanted to extend a personal thank you to my family who is here. Thank you. Thank you. And my father and sister who were not able to make it as well as uh, Bill Richardson and the Mayor McCormick that's in the office and those in the heart of the Billion Dollar Coal Field that were unable to make it but have showered me and uh, our projects with tons of support. So yes, we are uh, based in the heart of the Billion Dollar Coal Field and we are um, uh, having many successes and kind of spearheading uh, what I believe to be some of the most innovative approaches to sustainability today. Uh, we do emphasize the triple bottom line approach, but um, instead of like getting really convoluted with um, some of the more ideological aspects of uh, what environmentalism is or what the triple bottom line is, we've found that um, the triple bottom line, well, the, the, the main bottom line is uh, uh, the green becomes before green, right. <laughs> and um, health, healthy communities is basically our, our main strategy. So two of those, uh, just last week I had the opportunity of working in partnership with Coalfield Development Corporation based in uh, Wayne County, which is uh, one of our partnering counties, uh, to implement their workforce development training program. Hopefully we will be able to uh, touch base because y'all are way ahead of us, but we're as stated before, um, uh, following in other people's footsteps. And we had an opportunity of implementing the Coalfield Development Corporation's workforce development um, program that is specifically geared to absolve a lot of generational poverty uh, by building in a mentorship program into that workforce development. We also have uh, begun implementing or integrating into existing what's called an ESP program. I'm sure all the government folks here are uh, fully aware of all the acronyms that we drop on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> but what that stands for is the Employee Subsidized Program. So uh, the, the project that was launched last week for our SMART office, which I'm gonna talk about here in just a few moments, um, allows for us to target 18 all the way up to 40 uh, years old, uh, targeting welfare recipients as well as at-risk youth. And I, I had the opportunity of working with three great um, uh, guys on our smart office project last week on our deconstruction on what is going to be one of the what I believe to be one of the greenest offices in the United States. The interesting part about this story is it's located right next door to our chamber of commerce that is made out of 100% coal. So um, what we try to emphasize through our, our project development is it's not a us or, us or them um, problem, it's actually identifying synergies between the existing coal industry, which um, arguably if it wasn't for coal, we wouldn't have a lot of the freedoms that we have today, free time, um, electricity, oil, gas, whatnot. So it's something to be salute, as well as we need to, uh, uh, if we're gonna begin transitioning, we need to begin uh, transition within these communities across the nation, not just in Williamson, West Virginia. Um, the, the, the office located right next to the coal house, 100% um, coal, uh, it's, it's um, gonna be one of the first LEED platinum certified buildings in central Appalachia. Definitely the first one in West Virginia, that's leadership in energy and environmental design. It's also gonna be, um, I believe there's only 10 living building challenge uh, certified buildings in the entire North American region. This is going to be the 11th, hopefully, if we can get in the queue. 12th is fine as well. Um, we're also, um, it's going to be Energy Star certified, and we've been very mindful in the way that we've designed the office to uh, and, and enable us to integrate a workforce training component as we bring in other folks throughout the Coalfield region. The other second one, and I have to thank um, two of my really good friends out in New Mexico, 
Um, Monica Neese and Salim Sandoval. Um, Salim Sandoval is also a Green for All fellow, as am I. And uh, we've had opportunity of working with them over the past year to develop a federally qualified health clinic. Um, we just uh, secured a planning grant and we'll be applying for an access point grant uh, fairly soon. This is seen as kind of our incubator on uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is seen as our incubator for a lot of the other projects and building in uh, healthy communities, linking the FQHC project to our food systems projects, which we just launched our community garden about a week and a half ago, our lunch walk programs, walkable community programs, sustainable tourism. And these aren't just concepts in, in the coal fields. These are real world projects that we're working on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you. Thank you. Incredibly inspiring. And, and I think it's um, fantastic that all of you are really representing, you, you are the embodiment of what we at the federal level are really trying to achieve. I think in many ways this administration is one of the first that is stepping up and trying to link across uh, stakeholders, mm -hmm. uh, work in ways that help us uh, think more comprehensively about what sustainability means, and I think just hearing each of your stories is, is so tremendous. I wonder if we might um, talk, a, if you could talk a little bit about uh, some of the arguments or the words that you have found that have helped others in your community get on board with what you're trying to achieve. Uh, Brian, I think particularly, you know, in the school arena, Sometimes those are structures that are really hard to break new ideas into. How, do, how were you able to get teachers, the administration, parents, realizing that this was a great idea for kids to get involved in? Sure. I think, I think first and foremost, uh, when we were working on Board of Education policy, um, one of the, one of the it, was, it was an interesting debate. And one of the questions that came up is, what about all the cost that this is going to add to the, to the school district's budget? You know, having lost literally hundreds of millions of dollars um, from our budget, it, uh, we feel it. Um, and, you know, in brief, really, how I tend to open the discussion is by pointing out, um, although we'd like to th think that multinational corporations are going green because of benevolence and concern for health, and which is partially true, but it's really the bottom line. Going green does not generally add to the bottom line of our infrastructure, of our public or of our private sectors. It actually enhances the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And that's really how I start the discussion that's and great. then go deeper into the triple bottom line from there. That's so great. I think that's an introduction. Yeah. Lindsay, you want to add something? I would completely agree with all of um, Brian's remarks and say that there are also a lot of other co-benefits than just the money savings to most of the projects we're talking about. And just to use a, a brief example, when working for an elected official, I got to interact with a lot of members of our community, some of whom did not believe that climate change was occurring, did not believe it was caused by humans. And it was really easy to have conversations with those folks because I could say, okay, let's pretend that climate change is not a real, you don't have to give a hoot about the environment. Let me tell you why this project is good for you. And one really simple example is we've done a lot of work, like so many other municipalities, with changing out our um, traffic signals to LEDs. And uh, the city of Pittsburgh is now um, changing out some of its streetlights to LEDs, which provide a better quality of light, use less electricity. They also last a lot longer. So that's that many fewer times that you, when you're trying to drive to work in the morning or get stuck, in you know traffic when there's a bucket truck taking down a light for some reason when you mention just basic day-to-day -day things like that people are kind of like all right that's a good project if it keeps me from yeah. having to sit in traffic a little bit longer okay all right. that's great i think let me turn to this side of the table and ask a slightly different question because it strikes me that eric and deborah you are both uh, in positions that are also linked up and connected with larger national networks. Yes. Uh, Green for All right. and, and, and Emerald Cities. And right. so how, what do you, 
how can we share some of these great ideas and get them proliferated? Or do you see that happening? Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, go to um, www.emeraldcities.org. There we go. <laughs> and shout out to Denise Fairchild, who couldn't be here, but thank you for the, the nomination um, in tradeup.org. Um, but uh, really, what we can do together is really learn from what we're doing on the ground. It's all about partnerships. We couldn't do what we did without or do without the partnership of Emerald Cities and the AFL-CIO, um, and shout out to my family and husband and daughter and mother. <laughs> but um, the partnership with the AFL has really been tremendous for us because they already are, are a skilled workforce. They have the trainers. They have the, the curriculum. They have everything from soup to nuts. What we needed to do was just connect to an existing program. And so what we're doing is taking our pre-apprenticeship program and t taking our students through 10 weeks, and we clothe them from head to toe, um, everything from hard hats down to the steel toe boots. We make sure that they get to work on time, that they are skilled to get three certifications, OSHA 10, CPR, and first aid. And then they go on to get other certifications as they go. So it's all about taking community members from where they are, skilling them up, mm -hmm. trading it up, but also the collaborations of the other partners that are at the table. So it's the community colleges, it's the youth builds, mm -hmm. it's the, the trades all working together. And of course, the city of Atlanta. Um, we couldn't do it without the partnership. So I would say in, in terms of words, equity, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, making sure that people who have systematically been left out of the process and as we talk about greening our communities, really putting green in our communities is really what we need. Um, looking at projects that have been existing for a long time that they might not have thought about a workforce that may look like me. Mm -hmm. um, and so we want to make sure that as we, we put money, and as you talk about the administration, put money in these communities, in the, these neighborhoods, is that we really train them and really w work for partnerships on training. That's great. Thank and, you. And so, Eric, you, I love that line where you're stealing ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm completely with you on that. <laughs> so, so talk a little bit about how, you know, where do you look to steal ideas and how has that worked, you know, bringing it locally? Well, after this meeting, we're actually going to get meet with um, uh, one of my developing relationships with Anya Schoolman at Compu uh, Community Power Network. Mm -hmm. And it's through those, those specific networks, as well as Interstate Renewable Energy Council, Green for All, and many mm -hmm. other associated partners, that we've been able to kind of identify those ideas and develop innovative approaches to the way that they function to meet specific needs within the coal fields of Central Appalachia. And just to, just to highlight, that's and get on the actual word, the buzzwords and everything, yeah. is that that's one of the main reasons I did move to Central Appalachia to develop this project is it's, it's kind of along, along the lines of the same MIT philosophy in terms of technological innovation is you, 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 you seek to innovate specific technologies in third world conditions because you identify those, those limited conditions that increase innovation over time. Same thing goes with concepts. Mm -hmm. And the concepts of developing sustainable development, um, although it is spreading all over the, the United States, uh, I believe um, is the reason why we're seeing a lot of innovation around that. So take, for instance, the financing models and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, IREC and all them are coming in and helping us kind of bundle those into energy optimization. So we're not just focused on ener energy efficiency or renewable energy or, mm -hmm. you know, the futurist, of, like which is smart it grid. To the next yeah, we're building it all horizon. under one. Yeah. And uh, the buzzwords is, is that very thing of innovation is West Virginia and specifically um, the coal fields of West Virginia um, um, have, have been viewed as, you know, inbred hillbilly rednecks or whatnot. Yeah. And it's these stereotypes are, is what I find to be, you know, everybody points their finger at the coal industry and everything like that. And those are, uh, and, and the mono economies, and that, that's, that's fairly obvious in some respects, but uh, I know you need to wrap up, sorry. But um, um, just positioning Williamson and this region as a national leader in sustainable development really inverts those stereotypes. Yeah. So that's where we get the buy-in. Yeah, that's really fantastic. I think we might have time for oh. a question or, oh, really? Okay. okay. Anybody have any questions from the audience you'd like to raise for this illustrious group? I think we have mics here on the side. It's just easier if you.
go right to the, the system. Yeah, please. Hi. Well, first, I have to congratulate Lindsay because we were uh, previous Urban Sustainability Directors Network members. Oh, good. And, and we were yeah. actually buddies in Boston a couple of years ago. So I'm so proud of you and excited for all your accomplishments. And, and introduce yourself, please. So I'm Hillary Barnador. I'm the director of Star Communities. And oh, we're great. working on the Star Community Index, a, yes. a national framework for sustainable communities. And my question is actually kind of tied to the work that Lindsay and I did, both of, of which in our previous slides. But it's about, Ryan, your work. Um, you know, in, the, in local government, sustainability directors really are networking across the country in a way to share best practices and work together to really achieve much more momentum in our field. And I'm just wondering um, whether or not that's happening in the school systems. My experience has been very bottom up, like really awesome parents and kids and teachers, but how do we flip it so it starts coming top down and, and what do you think the future looks like there? Please. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you, we do, we do see the, the bottom up. The children, the, the faculty, um, the custodians, uh, the parents are all very much engaged in our community. And I, I think the energy is really there across, across the country. In terms of networking, absolutely. Uh, we have our environmental leadership team, which is the directors of all the county agencies in Mecklenburg County. We also have our statewide environmental stewardship initiative, which is run by the Department of the Environment and Natural Resources out of North Carolina, which is promoting environmental stewardship initiatives throughout the state. We're also partnered with the American Association of School Administrators Urban and Rural um, Healthy Schools Network, the American School Business Officials International uh, Environmental Team, and we've made presentations at Disney World, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, uh, all across the nation sharing best practices through, we have a 150 page environmental stewardship guide geared towards schools, okay? It has Great. success stories from schools and on and on and on, plus 30 uh, web pages available for schools to check in on. There's very much networking going on and I'd be happy to share information off the, offline with anyone who'd be interested in getting involved with those networks. Question. You're up. Hi, I'm Steve Jones from Trader, and I do have a question. Since uh, my director is partnering with Emerald Cities, uh, what? Uh, because I am a part of training. What? How are they going to partner with us to uh, get our guys trained for some of that retrofitting? It's a question for me. Or yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> Well, well, I mean, thank you for the leading question. <laughs> so um, the, the goal, of course, is to get as many folks trained as possible, but then also to get them on, on the jobs. And so we are seeking partnerships with the government, with the city, with the county, and of course the federal government um, to do these projects. But we're also, we also have a partnership with um, the Housing Investment Trust Fund and the Building Investment Trust Fund and some investors that are helping to actually seed um, resources into these communities. So one of the ways that we can actually partner is by helping to get some of that green in Atlanta so that we can actually get the, the training um, and the skill set up um, for the workforce. Um, thank you for the question, Steve, and I just want to make sure I say thank you to Kay and Chicha and Latasha and Harold and Leslie and, and Kayla and Lorenzo. Um, if I didn't get you before, and of course Don, um, our board member from um, Emerald Cities, but really it's really about um, collaboration and partnership in smart jobs, smart growth and smart jobs. So thank you. Well, and I think that you know, from my perspective, one of the things that is really going to um, create a strong foundation in this arena is the more that we can um, direct a lot of our local public works budgets, local housing authority budgets, mm -hmm. to the kinds of work that we're training people for, we'll then have a great alliance between the two, but between the workforce and the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So okay. I'm hearing conversations around the country about how places are really trying to marry the two up more intentionally. Okay. Sir. Afternoon. Um, my name is Gary Harris, and I'm president and CEO of HCS Enterprises, an energy engineering firm in, in Atlanta. Also the executive director for the Center for Sustainable Communities in Atlanta as well and also a great follower and supporter of Deborah Scott 
She's our, our supercharged, there. awesome leader of Emerald Cities Atlanta. So uh, glad glad to be here. But but uh, but this uh, question and comments for Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, uh, first comment. Um, I'm a I'm a former Pittsburgher, and I uh, miss those uh, party boat rides down the river <laughs> and such. Uh, can't can't wait to get back there. But uh, also, um, last week, uh, the uh, USA Today ran back-to-back -back articles, uh, front, front page articles about ghost factories, uh, talking about uh, uh, cities like, like Pittsburgh, which had a number of steel making, number of smelting, smelting uh, factories and, and uh, buildings and services around that industry and such. Um, some 300 sites around, around the country uh, need to be investigated and, and examined, and I think some of them may have been in, in Pittsburgh. One, are you familiar with, with, with the articles? And, and two, the articles hinted around environmental justice. Uh, each each, mm -hmm. uh, each um, article, front page article, showed a minority family which, which was impacted. Uh, can, can you comment on, on, on the articles and the potential impact in Pittsburgh? I, um, I actually I think that I missed the articles that you're talking about, but I know that that is an area that Pittsburgh and um, the larger region in Allegheny County have received a lot of attention for. Obviously, with um, the decline of the steel industry, we've ended up with a lot of brownfield sites, with a lot of, um, like you said, ghost mills. Um, we've also received a lot of positive attention as uh, successfully redeveloping some of that property. And one of the ways from a sustainability approach um, that we try to address the issue that you raised of environmental justice is making sure that those sites are multi-use. So um, one, one example is our Southside Works, which the city's Urban Redevelopment Authority was instrumental in redeveloping former site of a steel mill, um, sat vacant for many years, needed environmental remediation, and today it is redeveloped into a shopping, entertainment, and residential area. And so it's important that it's not just a shopping mall or it's not just a recreational area but that it also has mixed-use development so there are workplaces there there are um, apartments there I, I will say that in um, in some future development we may want to look at having even more mixed income housing in those areas but I hope that helped thank you um, I, I might just add that um, the We've talked about it in terms of equity, in terms of social justice. Um, the administration uh, has really uh, taken on uh, a greater focus on access to opportunity and making sure that uh, when uh, we at the federal government are investing in communities, we are cognizant of environmental justice considerations but also more and more asking our partners at the local level to look at the implications of, you know, who is benefited, you, you mm -hmm. brought that up, uh, whether it actually uh, lifts everyone up in a community, mm -hmm. and that in, in many ways that is a core element of our green and sustainable agenda. So um, I thank you for that comment, that was, that was very helpful. Um, we have run out of time, so I think I want to ask everybody, please thank this terrific panel. Thank you. Thank you.